All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Nwachu. I am a member of the BMI Board of uh, Trustees. I'm uh, delighted and very excited to welcome you all to this evening's program. If you're not aware uh, or familiar with the Baltimore Museum of Industry, uh, we are located at the waterfront just south, uh, south of the Baltimore's Inner Harbor. Uh, we are dedicated to telling the stories of the workers who built Baltimore into a manufacturing powerhouse. Uh, the museum is open to the public Thursday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And the museum also offers group experiences for students and adults. Uh, I would highly encourage you to visit our website, thebmi.org, that's T-H-E-B-M-I.org, uh, for details uh, and join us at the museum. We'd love to see you. Uh, programs like this are one that are made possible by the generous support of our members uh, and donors. If you are currently a supporter, uh, we thank you uh, gener uh, for your generosity. Uh, your help ensures that we can continue to engage people in important conversations um, like the one we're looking forward to tonight. Now, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, this is a webinar, so your cameras and mics are turned off. Uh, we encourage you to participate by asking questions using the chat feature. Uh, this program is being recorded and will be posted on the YouTube page for the museum. Uh, we anticipate this will last uh, just about an hour or so. Uh, I am pleased to welcome Elizabeth Anderson Comer, who is going to lead today's presentation. Uh, Elizabeth is an archaeologist who serves as the president of the Catoctin Furnace Historical Society in Frederick County and also president of EAC um, Archaeology Incorporated based in Baltimore City. Uh, Elizabeth studied at Hood College, the University of Kansas, the University of Maryland, and the University of London. It's a lot of education, Elizabeth. Uh, she has managed more than 350 archival and archaeological survey testing and excavation projects. She served as city archaeologist for the city of Baltimore uh, between 1983 and 1987, uh, specializing in urban, industrial, and waterfront projects. Elizabeth, thank you for joining us tonight and for sharing your work um, at the Catoxin Furnace. Uh, I'll turn the mic over to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to um, be with you um, and to tell you about the connection of Catoctin Furnace and the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Um, I started my career actually in Baltimore City, and I remember the beginning years of the Baltimore Museum of Industry and what a great addition that was to, uh, to the city of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. So it really is a pleasure to be here tonight to share with you some information about Catoctin Furnace. And if you're wondering what the reparative heritage of Catoctin Furnace has to do with the Baltimore Museum of Industry and with the iron industry, that's exactly what I want to share with you this evening. It has a great deal to do. Um, I know the Baltimore Museum of Industry tells the story of the workers of Baltimore City and the industry that created the city that we know and love today. And Catoctin Furnace before, during, and just after the revolution really powered the industrial revolution that then became uh, the might of the United States in the 19th and 20th century. And that work was done largely with the skills and the, the labor of enslaved Africans and freed African-American workers from the time of the revolution up until the end of the first quarter and into the second quarter of the 19th century. So that reparative heritage is one of the main focuses of our work at Catoctin Furnace to make sure that that story is told and told in such a way and shared in such a way that a collective kinship can be understood um, and shared, obviously, by people whose ancestors may have worked at Catoctin or who might be um, African-Americans whose ancestors might not have worked at Catoctin, but still can be part of that collective heritage. So Catoctin Furnace, it, my slide should have advanced. You can see my uh, first slide, right? I was actually just about to tell you, you took it down just about you would start talking. So you probably want to put it back up now and oh. share it again. 
Is it there again? Not yet. Okay, hold on. My mistake. I thought you were I'm doing an seeing... intro of some sort. <laughs> you want right, to do a share screen on the Zoom? It. Do the uh, share share screen button on the Zoom platform. Well, that is, I do know that button very well. And for whatever reason, <laughs> it's not coming up on my, hold on. And this worked perfectly in the uh, practice. So we're going to try this again. Um, coming up now. There you go. Okay, we got it. Great. All right. Great. Well, then my intro um, was, was, um, uh, was without that screen, but that's okay. Um, so, so Catoctin Furnace lacks a collective memory that includes the African American population. And this is one of the things that we've been um, sort of grappling with for the past nine or 10 years. Why is it? that we have um, a site that should be um, part of the history of the African-American population, not only in Frederick County and in Maryland, but for the entire United States. And yet that history, that connection is one that people uh, do not recognize, do not, uh, have not, uh, recognized and do not understand. So that collective memory um, was really lost um, in the 19th century um, and through the 20th century because the uh, African-American workers at Catoctin were replaced by European American workers who came to the United States uh, in the second quarter of the 19th century and after the Civil War as well. And their, the jobs at Catoctin went to the European American workers. And at that point, the sort of collective mentality, if you will, the memory of Catoctin shifted so that when the bicentennial came around in 1976, the idea was that Catoctin was wholly a European American um, site, one that the European Americans had made the shells that were used at the siege of Yorktown and made the stoves and implements for which Catoctin Furnace is famous. And that is in fact, not the story of Catoctin Furnace. So that is one of the things that we have tried to tell um, and to write that, that, that history. Catoctin Furnace, for those of you who are not familiar with our location, is in Frederick County. It's located just about six and a half miles north of the city of Frederick, um, south of the, of the town of Thermont. And it sits next to uh, basically what I call the toe of the Appalachian Mountains, uh, the Catoctin Mountains specifically, the Catoctin Range. And in the mid... Um, in the 18th and mid 19th century, the village was very much an industrial uh, complex. Um, it waxed and waned based on the, uh, the, both the national economy and the international economy. When there was war in, you know, in South America and there was a need for iron uh, or when there was a war in Europe, um, then the, um, uh, you know, the economy um, was uh, improved. And then when those things were not going on, um, obviously um, the economy uh, took a, a nosedive. And that sort of up and down uh, was really what happened throughout the 19th century. Uh, the Panic of 1819 is a perfect example of that. Our then owner, uh, Willoughby Mayberry, who had made a great deal of money during the War of 1812, lost everything in the panic of 1819 and the furnace was sold on the courthouse steps in Frederick. Well, but going back to the furnace size, it was smaller and larger depending on the demand uh, and the economy for iron throughout the late 18th and the 19th century. But in the mid to, to uh, in the mid 19th century, it had um, up to 80 houses. So it was quite a going concern. And of course, those workers were all um, engaged in the industry that is iron making. 
This image um, is a fanciful painting, if you will, of Catoctin Furnace, but it gives you an idea of the sort of uh, the village that was very much, um, uh, you know, it had everything you needed. It was very much a, a you know, a self-contained, uh, self-sufficient operation. Um, in the mountain are the charcoal haars. Uh, there's the large ore pits. There were several. Uh, worker housing, a church, a store, a company uh, office, an ironmaster's mansion, of which there were four actually ringing uh, the village. And then, of course, the central operation of making iron, uh, the furnace stack, the water wheel, uh, the power, um, and the forging, uh, the, the, the um, casting shed for forging iron. So that really was the, the makeup of the village. Again, very self-contained um, in its operation. So we know a great deal about the owners. Uh, for instance, the four brothers who band together to start Catoctin Furnace um, in, at the time of the revolution were very well healed. They came from Southern Maryland. Uh, there were several lawyers, there was a financier and a brother, James, who knew how to make iron. One of the brothers, Thomas, became the first governor of Maryland. So this family was very connected socially, politically, and economically to the elite in Maryland. And as I said, we know a great deal about their family um, and their, um, uh, you know, their, their genealogy and, and so much more. But what we don't know are the African-American enslaved and free workers at Catoctin. We know very little about them. And one of our quests is to find not only information about them through a, our scientific um, endeavors, but also to find a descendant community for these individuals. Our dream is to have people who are alive today be able to come to Catoctin Furnace and know that their ancestors, not just collectively, but perhaps individually worked at Catoctin and made the iron, made the wealth, made the power of the Johnsons, the Mayberries, the Brins, the Kunkels, the later owners, uh, but to know that their ancestors were the ones who were actually making the shells for the siege of Yorktown, building the houses, making the stoves, and really um, fully embrace that legacy which has been lost. This drone footage shows the village as it is now, and it's a very interesting village in that it very much retains the massing and the feel of a late 18th and early 19th century village. The store still exists, as does the church, uh, the worker houses line the street right up against the modern, the roadway, which is an 18th century roadway, but used now in a, in a 21st century um, manner. Uh, so very little separation, if you will, between uh, the cars and these uh, little, um, these worker houses. Um, we know who, you know, we know when these houses were built because we've done dendrochronology or tree ring dating. We assume that they were constructed by the enslaved uh, and free workers. Um, unfortunately, because they didn't own the properties, we can't know who, who actually lived in each one, but that um, their contribution, not only to the iron industry, but to the physical, um, presence, you, you know, the structures of the village is one of the things that, again, is part of the lost legacy that we're trying to bring to light at Catoctin. Colliering is one of the principal things that iron industry, uh, the iron industry needed in the 18th century and early 19th century. And because I know a lot of you are um, interested in uh, industrial history, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about how, how iron was made um, in, the, in a coal blast furnace um, and a hot blast furnace. Um, this um, illustration is of charcoal, of a charcoal hearth. And when I first started learning about uh, charcoaling and uh, the iron industry, I thought, oh, you know, making charcoal. 
How hard can that be? Well, let me tell you, it's extremely hard and it's also extremely skilled. There's no job at Catoctin, be it a collier, uh, be it a filler, a forgeman, um, a teamster, all of the jobs that we have researched at the furnace would be characterized as highly skilled, not just skilled, but highly skilled. And collaring is one of them. Each one of these pieces of wood that has to be chopped has to be a consistent uh, girth, diameter, and length. And that's because when it's uh, stacked into the hearth in a very um, prescribed and, and you know, uh, precise way, as you can see from this illustration, if the wood is not of uniform size and, you know, uh, length and width um, circumference, it won't burn in the same manner um, in this reduced oxygen atmosphere that is a collier hearth. So every log has to be cut to a specific length and then, um, you know, um, not just cut, you know, but um, you know, chopped, if you will. So the, it's the length and the width. And then it has to be stacked in a very prescribed way. Then the charcoal hearth has to be covered with a layer of clay that is, does not have um, any voids in it because it had the, the entire hearth has to be a reduced oxygen atmosphere that has to be tended for up to two weeks, 10 days to two weeks and 24 hours a day. And then and only then do you have the product of charcoal. The furnace required an acre of hard wood for every 24 hours it burned. It was in blast. So you can imagine the number of wood choppers and colliers who were working to make the charcoal to power this furnace. So again, very highly skilled. And our research has shown that in Africa, a lot of the colliers were women. It's very much a tending um, sort of uh, endeavor. And so uh, women were with the charcoalers on the mountain here at Catoctin, but in Africa, and charcoaling was primarily women's work. The charcoal hearths are spread throughout the mountain. And the, the amount of acreage that the Johnson brothers and later owners of the furnace had is indicative of, as I said earlier, an acre of hardwood for every 24 hours in blast. So they had 12,000 plus acres and also uh, some owners of land that were on the periphery of the furnace lands, what we call the greater furnace lands, sold charcoal to the furnace as well. The furnace required a great deal of charcoal. And we know that the colliers uh, and the wood choppers, the foresters, were actually practicing sustainable forestry. They were replanting the forest after they would uh, chop and make charcoal, chop the wood and make charcoal. And after about 30 years, that particular area would be ready again to be harvested for charcoal. So over the course of the mountain, we see over 1300 charcoal hearths, and we've been able to identify them using LIDAR. The LIDAR also has shown us how the pathways connected the charcoal hearths and then connected to the hearths the hearths to uh, the operation at the furnace, because once the charcoal was made, obviously it had to be transported to the furnace for the fuel, uh, the operation uh, of the furnace and the fuel. The charcoal hearths now don't look like much. They're just, uh, if you look very carefully, you can see a slightly flattened uh, area on the mountain, but in LIDAR, we can see them very clearly. And as I said, we've been able to identify 1,303 charcoal hearths on the mountain. So the charcoal was the fuel for the furnace. We also needed power and the power came from water. Little Hunting Creek comes off Catoctin Mountain. It's not a particularly big um, body or a big stream, but it's just enough 
to power a wheel. You don't want, you know, a raging fresh knit uh, to power a wheel. That can be um, too much power, if you will. So Little Hunting Creek was really perfect for powering uh, the, sh the wheel at Catoctin. The wheel then um, opened and closed two bellows. They were side by side. Those bellows shot air into the tuer and to the hearth of the furnace, and that made the heat that brought the furnace up to approximately 3,000 degrees, and that is how you get molten iron. From the top of the stack, a filler would put in a prescribed amount of charcoal, of limestone as flux, and iron ore, of course. And that you know, knowing how much of each of those to put in, again, the highly skilled filler, a very dangerous job, because as you can imagine, you're up on top of the stack, you're breathing uh, this molten, uh, you know, air that has zinc and uh, other part manganese and other particulates uh, and heavy metals that come out of the iron. But your job is to put just the right amount of charcoal, limestone and iron ore over and over and over into the stack as it is in blast. And then at the bottom, the, um, the forgeman and the, um, uh, the, for the forgeman had to know when, or the founder had to know when to tap the, um, the, uh, the plug in the hearth so that the molten iron would flow out into the pigs. And this illustration shows the pigs as well. Um, and they were the, um, the pigs were known as pigs apparently because they really do look like piglets suckling from a sow. Um, so look at the, in this illustration, you can see um, the, the gutter men. Um, and that are directing this molten iron that's at 3,000, approximately 3,000 degrees out of the hearth and into these sand moles or pigs on the floor of the casting shed. A very dangerous job, but again, I'm going to say it one more time, highly skilled, uh, highly skilled industrial workmen. So what did they make at Catoctin Furnace? These highly skilled uh, workers made the shells, as I said, they were used at the siege of Yorktown, but they also made these amazingly beautiful stoves, jam stoves. A jam stove is one that is fed, it's a German, a European and German style stove that's fed from another room or a hallway. These fell out of favor right after the revolution, but we had some made at Catoctin and you can see on the left, a, a jam stove plate marked J. Johnson and Company, 1776. And then on the right is one of our 1786 stoves. And this one, you can see very highly decorated, um, a lot of iconography, um, you know, there are, uh, you know, garlands, and in this case, uh, a woman leaning on an urn. Uh, the front of this stove says J. Johnson and Company, cat fur. Uh, 1786. So all of these casts were made at Catoctin. Uh, all these stoves were made from casts at Catoctin. And again, highly skilled, beautiful stoves, very decorative and very highly um, prized and valued. So who were the people doing this work at Catoctin? Well, initially, as we know, they were enslaved Africans with a few Af free African-Americans working there as well. This was known as the Mule Barn. And this is a photograph that was taken uh, in the very late years of the 19th century. But when we started looking at this quote unquote Mule Barn, we realized that there were in fact three chimneys on this Mule Barn. And I don't know about you, but I grew up on a farm and I know that the one thing one never does is put a chimney in a barn, ever. So we realized that this was actually not a mule barn. It was repurposed as a mule barn. But when we looked again and studied this photograph, we realized that this was in fact an a quarters for enslaved workers. 
The doors have been enlarged for its later use as a mule barn. Also, one of the area, one of the uh, three bays here was used for a blacksmith shop, but it is an in a quarters for enslaved workers. And it sits just across the road, or it's an archaeological site now, unfortunately. It's no longer standing, but it sits, uh, its site is just across the road from the furnace operation, from the Isabella furnace. So literally right across, um, you know, just a few steps away. We're very interested in how the workers were um, and, the, and the, the interaction between the workers and the um, owners at Catoctin. And so one of the things we've started looking at is the way in which the owners could control um, and surveil the, the workers um, even when they were at home. So to get at that information, we conducted a view shed analysis using LIDAR and using a bare earth model. And we were able to see that from the Iron Masters mansions that ring Catoctin Furnace, those are Windy Hill or Vallonay, Springfield Manor, Auburn Manor and the Iron Masters Mansion, that there was almost a, an uninterrupted view of the furnace operation itself when there were no trees, which is how it was uh, in the 18th and 19th century. And so this view shed analysis has helped us realize that the owners positioned their houses in our, in our um, estimation in such a way that they could in fact see the operation even from their bedroom windows. Working in a furnace was dirty and dangerous. The British for years have been studying the effects of iron industry on people, you know, on, you know, health. And fume fever was first identified in England um, as a disease, a, a process that really uh, had itself manifest in things like ALS, um, Lou Gehrig's disease, also um, in a hardening of the spinal cord. Breathing these uh, molten uh, or uh, the, the fumes from metals that are uh, released when iron ore, uh, uh, limestone and charcoal are burned goes right into your system. And we actually have uh, in our cemetery, one gentleman whose bones are completely, um, not just riddled, but um, he's, he's basically, all of his bones are filled with zinc. And that zinc, and there's no one else in the cemetery that has that level of zinc. So we think he may have been a filler um, and also one of the gentlemen that every um, couple months, the furnace stack had to be cleaned, which meant you had to go inside it and chip away all of the um, buildup. Again, you'd be breathing this heavy metal um, and that could have been, we believe, what this gentleman was doing. And the result is that he's really filled with zinc. So to get at the um, heavy metals in our iron, we started an XRF study, which is ongoing, to compare the iron at Catoctin with iron from furnaces like Cornwall and Hopewell to see if we could come up with basically a signature for the particulates or the heavy metals that would be, that could be differentiated between different furnaces. The reason we want to get at this information is that our stoves say Catoctin or Cornwall or Hopewell and other objects are sometimes marked, but nails, hinges, um, other utilitarian items like kettles, those aren't marked. And if we're able to identify a, you know, a, the, differentiate the iron source from these different furnaces, we may be able to see, uh, you know, patterns of movement of the iron, where the iron was sold, where it was utilized. Um, and so this is an ongoing study that we're hoping to get additional funding for, uh, but it would be um, a very, um, 
it would be a great addition to what we know about, um, you know, about the use of iron uh, in these different, from these different furnaces. So I mentioned the gentleman a few minutes ago that whose, whose bones are filled with zinc. And you may wonder, how do we know this about someone who worked at Catoctin? And that's because through an accident of history, basically in the late 1970s, a roadway construction project for US Route 15 was slated to um, be built along a corridor uh, from Frederick to the Pennsylvania line. And because of the passage of the Historic Preservation Act in 1966, uh, there was a, a, you know, um, not just a desire, but the, um, the requirement that the new alignment be surveyed for its effect on archaeological and historical um, uh, resources. And so as part of that Section 106 uh, investigation, a phase one archaeological survey took place, and that consisted of shovel test pits. And in the Catoctin area, two shovel test pits were excavated in an area uh, just south of the furnace, and two graves were located. The project included oral history, and a gentleman um, was told the archaeologists that his dog one night had gone out, or he, he was following his dog, because his, his dog was out, you know, howling, and he went out, and his dog had uh, chased a, a groundhog into uh, a hole, and he realized that the groundhog was bringing bones up. So he had an idea, he quickly filled in the hole, but he had an idea that there was a cemetery there. Uh, he called it a Native American cemetery. But the archeologists um, realized that it was a cemetery um, as well. And so the State Highway Administration hired a crew to actually excavate the part of the cemetery, about a third of it, that was in the alignment for the roadway. Now, I just want to point out that this was 1979, and we're now in 2022. So if this happened today, that road would move, not the cemetery. Um, but in 1979, uh, the attitude was different, and the idea was that the cemetery um, could be excavated, and the roadway would stay where the designers had planned it to be built. So as part of that excavation, you can see in this slide, the green part, the green square is the part of the cemetery that was excavated. The orange square is the part of the cemetery that is still in place, unexcavated. And then the gray um, is an area where we did ground penetrating radar uh, just a couple years ago to see what might still be in the part of the cemetery that's still in place. So the excavation in 1979 located 35 graves. And from those 35 graves, 33 individuals were removed. And again, these individuals were removed because at the time, the idea was that the roadway came first and that the graves you know, were, you know, were secondary. So this map shows you the 35 graves that were excavated. Um, and then the roadway off to the left. And they, in our analysis, um, what we've been doing is looking at this graveyard and reanalyzing it. The 1979 excavation was, for 1979 standards, was excellent. It was well done. It was well documented. Um, it was very carefully done. And the archeologists um, realized that they were in need of expertise. They immediately called the Smithsonian and had the then forensic chief forensic anthropologist, Dr. Lawrence Angel, uh, come up uh, and, and agree to look at the skeletons that were being removed from this cemetery. There were very few, uh, there were really no uh, grave goods in the cemetery. There are nails coffin nails. These are some examples. 
And they range from the hand wrought rose headed nails of the um, 18th century to uh, 19th century cut nails. So we have a wide range of uh, a fairly wide range of dates of nails in the um, in the coffins. Some of the early analysis of the um, skeletal remains uh, realized or came up with uh, uh, data that indicated, for instance, that uh, there was um, a great deal of um, rickets in the population, and we're you know rickets can be uh, there's there are many reasons that, or several reasons that one can uh, develop rickets. But one of the reasons, in addition to poor diet, is lack of sunshine. And we know that when the furnace was in operation, um, the area was very polluted. And so we don't know if the uh, long bones that we see with rickets are because of that industrial pollution that affected even the young children at the furnace, but that's very pop popular or very possible rather. One of the few artifacts that was associated with the individuals were uh, pins, copper pins that were used to pin hair on some of the women uh, in, the, uh, in the cemetery. And this is an example of some of one of the pins and men had buttons. The women had no buttons. They, their clothing would have been closed with uh, tapes, um, but the men had uh, bone buttons, fabric covered buttons, and brass buttons, some of which may have been reused from earlier uh, pieces of clothing. These were on jackets, possibly, and pants based on their location in the grave. But again, only the men had buttons, um, and these are the only, uh, you know, artifacts that are in the, uh, that were in the cemetery, um, in addition to, uh, obviously, the skeletal material. The demography of the, um, of the population is, again, very uh, interesting, and I'll draw your attention to the 10 to 19-year-old um, uh, the number of 10 to 19 year olds in the cemetery. Um, it's actually 20%. Um, we realize that when babies are young, you know, they're, they're tiny, they're vulnerable, old people get old and they die, but you don't expect teenagers in the prime of their life between 10 and 19 years of age to die at these at this high uh, percentage of you know population, so we think that one of the one of the things that this indicates is lack of proper diet, but also overwork, uh, just basically wearing a person down so that if they became ill, they didn't have the resilience, uh, the stamina to fight off an infection or an illness because they were already you know, worked to the bone and worked, you know, weakened. Uh, in a, they were in a weakened state. So that is very, a very curious, but perhaps telling part of the story of Catoctin. We've been working in addition to the um, reanalysis of the individuals in the cemetery, we've been looking again at the historical record uh, to try to figure out who was at Catoctin. Unfortunately, we have only first names, but we are beginning to put together families. And this is based on Moravian records that we've had translated from the old German. So for instance, we believe that Magdalene is the, or we know actually now that Magdalene is married to old Jack and that Joe in, and is old Jack, Joe and Sal are old Jack and uh, Madeline's, Magdalene's children. This is because the Moravians did record the births, baptisms, marriages, and burials of African-American enslaved from Catoctin Furnace, and they included those 
uh, in their ledgers. They were required to keep a diary. And those diaries, again, are in German. Um, and we have had them, we've had a gentleman working for over a year now, translating these diaries, looking for every mention of African Americans, not just at Catoctin, but at all, all parts of Northern Frederick County. Um, and also things that would tell us about life, like pan, like epidemics, illness, weather events. Um, and, and that's how we're putting together the story or the history of the area around Catoctin Furnace. When we began our reanalysis of the individuals at Catoctin that were excavated in the cemetery, we received after the third try, a small grant, and this has been eight years ago. So the grant was enough that we could afford to do two uh, human genome uh, or DNA sequences, but it allowed us to do a craniometric analysis. This is a methodology that's been used for years um, and there's actually a very large database throughout the world um, because crania do vary. Um, they're very exact measurements of, you know, of nose cavity and forehead and jaw, but they can tell somewhat um, with, with some um, accuracy um, locations and groups of people um, that you know, where, where people are from. And this is particularly something that has been looked at in Africa. So we started with this analysis, and this will be very interesting to see if this really holds true when we are able to um, fully analyze our ancient DNA analysis uh, or data. But what we found is that we had, uh, it appears, that we have individuals uh, that are from uh, Calabar, Ashanti, uh, Zulu individuals, and then also the Gold Coast. So again, this is a very um, now, you know, sort of um, superseded by the science of, of DNA, but it'll be very interesting to see if any of these um, hypotheses um, do, uh, you know, hold water, if you will, uh, when we're able to, to uh, put all this, uh, all the data together. Um, this is our craniometric analysis. Our analysis shows that some individuals were from South Africa, Zanzibar, uh, Tanzania, South um, East Africa, and then also from uh, South, the, the we Western Africa. So those are Nigeria, Gold Coast, um, uh, and those um, areas uh, near Ghana. <clears throat> so the analysis that we undertook, the reanalysis, I should say, of the um, cemetery um, also came up with um, a very unusual genetic um, condition. Six of the 30 three individuals have this, and it's called, it's craniostenosis, which is a premature closure of the um, suture it, it, the, in the skull. And so it manifests itself in, in several different ways, but one of the ways it can manifest itself is in elongation of the skull. So I always use the analogy of the bust of Nefertiti. Um, her skull is, is very long and sort of elegant. Um, and so that is an example of that, um, of that condition. Here are three crania from Catoctin that have this. And these individuals um, simply, their skull was, was, was sort of elongated. Um, so we, our forensic facial reconstructions actually show that um, because the individuals we selected uh, are individuals that had the craniostenosis. And we know these individuals now were related to each other. So it was a genetic uh, condition, it's quite rare, but because the individuals at Catoctin were members of families and, you know, those families passed the gene on, and that's why we have such a high incidence of craniostenosis. So as I said earlier, our first research grant 
um, had enough money in it for two, uh, two the, you know, the analysis of two individuals using um, DNA. But when we were able to um, develop a partnership with the Reich um, lab at Harvard University, we were able to do 14 of these uh, individuals. And then when those were all successful, we were able to do 15 more. So at this point, 29 individuals have been sequenced. Um, and of those, 27 have usable uh, a full human genome that we will be able, hopefully, to connect with people who are alive today to, to bring them back to their connection with Catoctin. So I mentioned earlier that we were able to identify uh, families. And this, this um, image shows you uh, the Hapala groups um, that are at Catoctin and the relatedness. And then this image shows you the five families that we have been able to identify in what is basically um, graveyard um, geography. This family, um, it's a mother and two children and then a brother. This is a mother and her son and a brother. I want to show you, though, these men who are sort of outliers. Morphometrically, they're outliers. They're not related to anyone in the cemetery, <clears throat> but also they're buried on the outskirts of these families. So it's a really interesting question that, you know, about the cemetery geography, if you will, um, because these gentlemen may have been people who were brought to Catoctin with specific skills. Um, they were brought to, you know, as iron workers. Um, and so they were not part of these families that for several generations were living um, at Catoctin. So this um, gentleman on the left is a morphometric outlier. He has the craniostenosis. Uh, and then um, this is our uh, 11 and a half to 12 year, or one of our 11 and a half to 12 year old males on the right. This is one of the gentlemen that I was telling you about who really was at the prime of his life, um, a young man, um, and yet um, with no apparent, um, there wasn't an accident. I mean, he doesn't have like uh, broken bones that would indicate that he fell or hit his head or, you know, something that would um, be a fatal accident. So he died from a condition that um, was, you know, was is not apparent. I will say that one of our future goals is to undertake plaque analysis um, which is a much more refined way of seeing what one was eating. Uh, now, of course, we go to the dentist and have our plaque removed, which is a shame because plaque um, holds a great deal of information about what you're eating, what your uh, uh, health is. Um, and so that's one of the ways we might be able to get at what the condition was that was proving fatal for these young uh, men and women who should have been um, in the prime of their life. We're also looking at the white workers um, at Catoctin because we now know, or we, we suspect strongly, I should say, um, that there was intermarriage between um, the white workers and the African-American workers, and not just marriage, but there was, um, we, well, as an example, we have um, a young woman in the cemetery whose father is definitely white. So we have contacted the uh, descendants of the owners of several of the owners, and they're very, they have put their DNA into our research, into the research databases, because they're very interested in knowing if their um, ancestors or what, what their ancestors were, um, uh, you know, what their role was, if you will, in the population of the African Americans at Catoctin. Because we're very interested in the rest of the um, cemetery, uh, we did ground penetrating radar, and that was allowed us to identify 
uh, the graves that are still there, and this is an image of the ground penetrating radar, the blue boxes are graves, um, and you can see that the, uh, the ovals are trees and the, um, the small squares are stones. So we have both headstones and footstones um, that mark these graves. And you can see also there are two uh, paths that go through, uh, through the cemetery, but this is based on ground penetrating radar. This is a typical marker. Um, well, I shouldn't say typical because there is no typical grave marker. The, some are rounded, some are pointed, um, some are cryptocrystalline, they reflect light. Um, they're all local field stones, but you can see that they were very, they were purposely chosen and purposely placed uh, in familial groupings. Um, and those are the stones uh, at Catoctin. Our uh, Silver Oak Academy students, um, this is a program we've had now for eight years, are, uh, this is a, a, a photograph of them at the Smithsonian um, meeting with Doug Owsley and learning about the forensic um, uh, research. But these students are part of our Heritage at Work, which is a program in which they learn historic preservation building skills. They also do culinary um, arts. They are living history um, uh, in, reenactors in our Spirits of the Furnace and in their own voices. Um, they make traditional apple butter. Um, they were, they help tend the garden and learn skills there. So they're very much a part of everything that we do um, at Catoctin Furnace. We, um, when we be began planning for our Museum of the Iron Worker, which opened in July of 2021, so just six or seven months ago, we wanted to tell the story of the enslaved Africans um, at Catoctin. And we then realized that the way, the best way to do that was going to be through uh, a forensic facial reconstruction project. So again, we found a grant to hire really the, the, the best studio in the world, in my opinion, and many other too, other, others too. It's Studio Ice in Brooklyn, New York. And we worked with them for over a year to, um, to make these two forensic facial reconstructions that are now in the Museum of the Iron Worker. And when you come, which I hope you will, uh, you'll be able to see these. This is a 15 year old boy. Um, of course, he was in the cemetery. Um, his story is, is similar to the uh, other people in the cemetery in that he already at the age of 15 displays um, significant um, changes in his skeleton based on hard, repetitive um, work. His spine is already compressed at the age of 15, which means that had he lived as an older gentleman, he would have been bent double. And we do have an older gentleman in the cemetery who could not stand up straight. He, and we know from the Moravian diaries, he's mentioned, uh, unfortunately not by name, but he's mentioned as being a cripple with an attendant helping him. But this young man, unfortunately, didn't live long enough. Um, he died at the age of 15, um, but he is the forensic facial, re one of the forensic facial reconstructions that we, um, that we chose. And the other is this 30 year old, 30 to 35 year old mother. She has a head wrap that was, um, was created by Cheney McKnight. Um, she's at the New York Historical Society. She has a, a really amazing um, blog called, um, and Facebook um, group called Not Your Mama's History. You may have heard of her. Um, she's an expert in African-American head wraps and African-American uh, clothing, uh, culinary arts. Uh, she's just an amazing researcher. So Cheney wrapped uh, using linen, uh, just this very small piece of linen, as she 
her perception that it would be um, just a scrap, but to keep the hair clean um, and to cover the head, that would be what the mom at Catoctin would, would have on her, um, over her, her hair. This mom is buried, was buried with her infant son. The infant lived just a few months after she died. So we can pretty much assume that this mom died in childbirth. Uh, she has a brother also in the cemetery. Um, but when she died a few months later, her little infant son was buried above her. So I mentioned before our Heritage at Work program. Uh, we're, we're very um, proud of this program. It, it took a hit during the pandemic like everything else, but it's a building trades skills program that we work, um, we work with the Silver Oak Academy students. Um, they also, this is our heritage um, kitchen garden behind the log house. I'm showing you all these pretty photos so you'll come to Catoctin Furnace to see, uh, see for yourself. We do open hearth cooking in the uh, 1810 Collier's Log House. Uh, here are some of our students from Silver Oak Academy uh, working uh, on the Forgeman's House, which is now totally restored. Um, and we're very, very, very happy to say that our Enslaved by Iron Smithsonian Channel uh, mission critical film is complete. It is now being scheduled. We don't know when it will appear on the Smithsonian Channel, but um, it will be, we'll be letting everyone know, but please, um, look out for that because um, frankly, uh, the Smithsonian Channel did an amazing job, I'm just gonna say. So we're very pleased with that um, and proud to be part of that. We would love for you to come to the Museum of the Iron Worker. It's open every weekend, Saturday and Sunday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, it's located in the village of Catoctin Furnace. And we hope this summer to be able to be open uh, extended hours. Uh, not just on the weekends, but during the week. So stay tuned on that. If you want to come during the week and can't come on the weekend, just give us a call and we'll arrange a special tour. And if you have a group, we have rates for that and we will do special guided tours as well. We just want people to come, obviously. Um, coming up May 21, 22 is our Maryland Iron Festival. Um, it's been it was virtual in, tw in 2020 and then in 2021 it was virtual, but then we did a, a second, a redo in September uh, live, but we're planning in May of 2022 to be fully live. And this will include a uh, pouring, a metal pouring, a metal, metal casting. So you might wanna come and see that food trucks, uh, artisans, blacksmithing, metal casting, uh, tours of uh, Catoctin Mountain Park, uh, the charcoal trail, um, and uh, games like our cannonball toss, which I think is the most popular thing there. And we also have a beer and wine and food trucks. So it's a really nice event. So please mark your calendar. And then Spirits of the Furnace, we hope will be live again. It's, it was, um, uh, unfortunately, um, we were not able to do it um, during the pandemic, but it's a, a guided walk through the village at night by lantern light, um, and actors uh, tell the story of being at Catoctin. And then our traditional village Christmas, where you can design your own Christmas wreath, uh, will this year be December 3rd, um, and it's a village-wide um, event. So, this is a long list of people to say thank you to. And now we, uh, we want to add the Baltimore Museum of, of Industry for allowing us to be on your platform because you are obviously the big guys in town, but it is, it's great to be part of your, um, of your program because while you are, you know, Bethlehem Steel and the, the industry that really, um, really flourished in uh, Baltimore, we can really say um, at Catoctin Furnace that we're, we're the ancestor. Um, and we also believe um, that our, some of our workers from Catoctin, again, highly skilled um, industrial workers 
moved to Baltimore and may have been then workers at Bethlehem Steel and in some of the other iron industries. So that concludes my presentation. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll be happy um, to take um, any questions that you might have. Well, Elizabeth, I see we've got um, two here at the moment in the Q&A. One is the distribution of iron in Maryland and how it was mined. And then another, um, we can get back to this, but um, industrial facilities using both enslaved and paid workers. Um, and so maybe just talking a little bit about that, that breakdown. So um, Singlewald in 1911 did a really extensive um, study of iron making in Maryland. And we go back to that all the time. It's one of these things where he was much closer to uh, being able to talk to people who were still um, alive, who were working in the iron industry. Um, he also, uh, because he was a geologist, he was looking at the iron um, uh, sources, which of course is critical. One of the things we've been doing recently in a research project called Recovering Identity is looking at the earlier furnace in Northern Frederick County called Hampton Furnace. And Hampton is about 15 years older than Catoctin uh, up on um, uh, just west of, of Emmitsburg. But the problem with Hampton is that they situated it, but then realized they didn't have the ore. So what that meant is they started hauling ore from Catoctin and then they're like, well, this is not sustainable. Um, so they moved the operation to Catoctin and Hampton was never an iron furnace again. So there are furnaces like that that sort of um, were started but didn't, um, didn't survive. Our Iron Road uh, brochure, which we're about to reprint and we're going to include the Baltimore Museum of Industry in it, um, gives you an overview of iron furnaces in Maryland, all the way from the eastern shore at Furnace Town, Nassawango, all the way to Lona Coning, um, and then up, of course, into Pennsylvania, Cornwall, Hopewell, Pine Grove, um, and then in Maryland, uh, a bunch of the um, furnaces like, um, uh, you know, Catoctin, um, Antietam, Antietam Furnace, Antietam Iron Works, those are two different things, uh, or two different furnaces, Old Forge, Mount Etna. Uh, of course, we also know that our oldest furnace is Principico, um, and we're hoping it will be um, included in our next Maryland Iron Festival, um, pardon me, Maryland Iron Road brochure. So, um, if, you're, if you are interested in a deep dive into the sources of iron throughout Maryland, I would go to Singlewald. It is available on, on the, um, you know, it's open source. Um, and uh, he was with the Maryland Geological Survey. And he really did a deep dive into the iron sources um, in Maryland. And not all these furnaces operated for as long as Catoctin. We operated, I saw this uh, question pop up, we closed in 1903, so we operated for more than 130 years, um, which is quite a long time for an iron furnace in Maryland. Some, most did not last anywhere near that long. Either they ran out of ore, which we did not, or there were other factors, you know, they had a salamander and they just didn't want to clean it up, they just closed down or they were not on a transportation network um, once the railroad came in. There were a myriad of reasons, but, um, but Catoctin operated until 1903. And I'm sorry, Ani, what was that second question? I think I've nailed the first one, I hope, um, yeah. but what was that second question? Well, we do have um, quite a few more questions that just came in and I think, um... Perhaps we'll spend another five minutes on questions and then we'll wrap up just to be mindful of time. Um, but the second question was just about the breakdown of both enslaved and paid workers within one site. And just if you could elaborate on. on that. Sure, and that, that's a really kind of a moving target. We know that the majority of the workers at the beginning were not paid. They were, they were um, 
enslaved. However, we also know that there was a system of overwork for which you could work, 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 and then get a little uh, payment uh, for that extra time. So um, then what we see is a transition from the enslaved Africans to uh, the European Americans who were paid uh, in the second quarter of the 19th century. So I'll try to answer these questions relatively quickly so we can get through a lot of them. And also my email, uh, Ani, if you want to share that, if anybody wants to follow up, we're ha I'm happy to answer these questions as well. Great. Um, so I'm just seeing two in the chat here. Um, so the Hampton Furnace, was that connected to the Ridgely family at Hampton Mansion? And then there was another Baltimore County question about um, Oregon Ridge. Okay, so the Hampton, no. Hampton Mansion's furnace was called North Hampton and it's now under the reservoir. And it was, it was very much um, uh, powered by enslaved labor. Um, uh, the Ridgelys um, had uh, made a great deal of money, as did the Johnsons, um, with these iron furnaces. Um, you know, it's a wartime economy. You're making iron. You're making money. I mean, all you have to do is look at the mansions at Catoctin to see the amount of money, power, um, and, you know, that these people were making off the labor of the enslaved. But Northampton is a different furnace. It's now under the reservoir. Hampton Furnace has no connection with the Ridgely family. It's just west of Emmitsburg. We're trying to find it. And I'm sorry, what was the second question? Um, Oregon Ridge. In oh, Oregon Ridge. Yeah, again, not connected, but, but obviously these are, you know, there was a great deal of incentive to make, uh, to develop an iron furnace if you could get the capital together, because it really was a way like a grist mill, it was like, it was like having a bank, let's face it, okay, you could make a lot of money, or you could lose a lot of money. Great. Um, a quick question. Um, could you share who did the drone and LIDAR work? I'm sorry, what was the question again? Um, could you share who did the drone and LIDAR work? Oh, okay, sure. We just, uh, I'm actually an archaeologist in my real life. So uh, LIDAR imagery is available um, you know, every county, I think, has it now because it's part of basically national security. But you have to know how to post-process it. So we have this, frankly, very expensive software that does that. Um, if you have an area that you want to, you, you have something that you are dying to look at LIDAR for, if you can pinpoint it for us in, and, and you can find, we'll tell you how to get the tile of LIDAR data. It's just a point cloud of data, but we can help you. But you have to know, I mean, don't tell us you're looking at an area the size of an acre and a half because that's just, you know, or, you know, if you can pinpoint, we can help you. Okay, that's one. And then the other question was the drone. Um, we, we have a drone, so <laughs> I'm sorry, but we own a drone. So we just, you know, there's a, some overlap between having an archaeology company and being a volunteer. What can I say? <laughs> All right, and I think this will be our last question. Is there evidence for an African-American church at the village and or how did it be enslaved workers of the village practice their faith? That is a great question. And the Moravian Diaries for the first time are shedding a great deal of light on that. The, the enslaved would, the Moravian ministers were coming to Catoctin and preaching, but the Johnsons eventually allowed their enslaved workers to go to church at Graceham, but with the condition that they come home as soon as the service was over. Um, and one of the um, African-American attendees was very upset because people didn't want to sit next to her, um, and she felt very bad. Um, they, the, so the, the African Americans also were, um, recorded as singing in their own manner, singing the Moravian songs, which means to me that they were, you know, taking the song, but changing it to be more, uh, perhaps what they were used to, uh, the songs that they had learned or the rhythms that they had learned when the Episcopal, when, when the Anglican, um, 
church, the Episcopal church was built in Catoctin and Furness, um, then that ser those services were held and they were attended by both the African-Americans and the European-Americans, but always the Methodists were in the background with these sort of um, these uh, uh, services that both the Moravians and the Episcopalians thought were a bit too, I don't know, juicy or a little too, um, I don't know. We're trying to figure out exactly what they, but they were all, always complaining that the Methodists were stealing away the, um, the African-American um, uh, attendees. But there's a lot, the religion is very much a part of the life of the um, of the enslaved. And um, that's, you know, one of the things that, as I said, these Moravian diaries are really shedding light on this for the first time. Elizabeth, thank you so much for the great presentation. This was very, very insightful. Uh, and thanks to everyone who joined us today as guests um, and for your great questions at the end, especially um, also very insightful questions. I think many of us are now eager to actually see the site in real person. Um, and on that note, I want to remind our current members at the museum that there will be a BMI members only tour um, of the village of Catoctin Furnace led by Elizabeth on Saturday, April 30th. That's Saturday, April 30th. Invitations to register for this tour will be sent out after this presentation. If you are not yet a member, I would highly encourage you to join and be a member and take advantage of this opportunity and the many more that come behind it because there's a lot of good stuff happening at the museum. Um, on that note, I wanted to say thank you again, everyone, uh, Elizabeth, especially to you uh, for your time this evening to be on my staff. Uh, and all of our guests. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Thank you, Jay. This was great. I really appreciate you allowing me to do this. Thank you again. Awesome. Thank you.